Good morning and welcome to this, the 86th Virtual Bridge. Um, yes, it's been going for all that time and we've just been discussing the tier system, but no tiers here. Today we're going to be talking about a toolkit for effective learner engagement um, they, in ways the pinnacle and the, the be all and end all of education is learner engagement. So a very uh, important topic and especially since uh, circumstances have changed. Uh, we have Steph Black with us from Sparks and Margaret Livingston from Education Scotland. And Margaret is going to open things up. Over to you, Margaret. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're here to, to launch a toolkit for effective learning enga learner engagement, and it's been co-created by Sparks and Education Scotland. Uh, some of you might be aware Education Scotland created a list of resource packages to support colleges during the, um, the COVID pandemic and to support the recovery um, beyond COVID. So these were based around four themes, curriculum, learning, teaching and assessment, services to support learning, transitions and evaluation to facilitate improvement. Sparks had also created um, a set of questions and a resource to help learning engagement, which Steph will talk more about um, later. We came together to, um, we, I initially started to map the questions from the Sparks resources to the Education Scotland resources. And we quickly decided that probably what was needed was a separate toolkit um, just to illustrate how best to use both sets of resources and how people who are supporting learners in colleges can make best, best use of the Our Best Future and the Sparks resources um, coming together. I hope that makes sense and I hope this morning we'll be able to illustrate how that can happen. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Yeah, so as Margaret Rose has touched on there, um, and some of you will be aware, at Sparks we developed an updated student learning experience tool um, that was in response to the pandemic, and we wanted to include questions that um, would have facilitated a discussion between staff and learners around about how the pandemic had impacted on their learning experience across our seven student learning experience headings. Um, and as Margaret Rose has said, we started to kind of think about how that could be mapped to the Our Best Future resources. Um, but it was evident that um, a, a new resource that really was um, a toolkit, something that could be used by student associations, by learner engagement teams and um, by colleges would be the most useful way forward. Um, and so I'm gonna just share with you um, my screen, which will bring up the, the resource so that people who maybe haven't had a chance to look at it already um, can see what it looks like. So this is our toolkit for effective learner engagement. Um, and um, it basically goes through the different themes that are covered in the Our Best Future resources, um, which you can see here on the contents page. Um, and really, this is a, a resource, a toolkit that is, is for colleges to think about how they're meeting the expectations set out from the Our Best Future resources around learner engagement. And within this resource, we really put um, a commentary and questions to colleges to consider um, what they are doing and maybe what they haven't thought about doing so far and um, to how they can um, ensure that learners are engaged and influencing and scoping the planning and delivery um, of their learning and teaching, their curriculum, um, conversations around assessment, about the support that learners are receiving and around about planning for the future. So how are they engaged in conversations about enhancement, about um, improvement? Um, and we're hopeful that this will be kind of a, a very kind of useful toolkit for colleges to have these kind of conversations. Um, so as I go through the toolkit, you'll kind of see under um, each section, we have a slight commentary that kind of introduces you to that theme um, and, and sort of gives a bit of background as to what we know has happened and kind of what has been the experience of learners. And then there's a, a section of self-reflection questions for the colleges. So here's what we need the colleges to be thinking about. How are they engaging with student association? Um, have they thought about how they're engaging course reps? Um, what kind of conversations are going on at a, a strategic level, perhaps? And then the questions that come from our student learning experience tool. Here's the questions that you need to be thinking about when you're engaging with learners. Here's some of the conversations you might need to be having. Um, and that follows throughout the whole resource. It takes you through in a very kind of um, simple format to take you through each different theme um, that you can then work on. Um, and the great thing about this as well is it can be embedded to conversations that are already happening. So um, when colleges are thinking about um, 
sort of these types of questions. They can be put into student staff consultative committees, for example, they could be put into internal surveys. There's other ways that they can be then having these types of discussions, as well as looking at this resources like a, a, a joint alignment to the Our Best Future resources. And what we hope is that this provides a framework um, for the colleges to be able to meet the expectations set out within the Our Best Future resources, but also it'll help colleges in evidencing how they are um, um, engaging learners um, in the planning and delivery um, of this kind of recovery year from the pandemic. Um, it's about 12 pages long, so it's also quite a manageable resource. We didn't want it to be something um, that was a, a huge ask for, for everyone on top of everything else that everyone's already dealing with. And we wanted it to be something um, that you could dip in and out of and that you can then have a look around and think, right, these are some of the stuff we're doing quite well, actually. And um, here's some of the other questions that on reflection we could be doing more about. And let's think what that's going to what that's going to take forward. Um, so that's kind of just to give you that kind of overview into the resource and kind of how it's how it's come about. Um, I don't know then if anyone has any questions or any considerations around about how they're maybe thinking this resource could be used within their within their own college or how they can kind of take forward some of these discussion points um, or if there's any other sort of general questions about the resource that we, we can answer. I think one of the things I, I just wanted to say as well, you know, our best future shows the, the expectations, but maybe at a higher level um, and where we felt the gap was was looking at and giving these prompts and suggestions as to how colleges can best engage with learners. So this is really focusing on um, you know, how we meet those expectations for learners. I think as, as Steph was saying that, you know, even if anybody has any comments to make about how they've been engaged up to now um, in planning for like curriculum changes or adaptations to curriculum, um, that would be quite a, a good point to, to start with. And there's a question there from and for Andrew. Uh, Andrew, would you like to come up mute and ask it? Yeah, so uh, who would be the best person to ask within the college to answer the college-sided questions? Probably there will be somebody in, I mean, obviously every college is different depending on their structure. So um, who's, who's the person that line manages you, Andrew? So I, I don't have a direct line manager uh, just due to being in the student association. Yeah, uh, so but... do you have a link? Uh, yeah, so uh, we have the coordinator uh, of the Student Association. There's also the vice principal who I work quite closely with. Right. So, I mean, ultimately, the vice principal would be working with somebody from the quality department, ultimately to um, to complete their best future and give the, the college um, story, so to speak. So I think I would be looking at, at your linkage person. And that's that was one of the things that Steph and I had discussed as well, you know, that we know there's a community of practice within US for people who work with student associations, but we felt there was maybe a space here as well for um, conversations to take place as to how best student associations could be supported within colleges. Um, and that's something we wanted to ascertain from this morning. If this kind of forum is something that you would welcome going forward, um, maybe even just twice a, a term or, or something, you know, we don't want to overburden people, but just a space to, to talk about what the challenges are and, and what's coming through and what the common themes are. Thank you for that. And Brian, uh, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just thinking about how externals or industry partners um, that want to get involved in education, because I know there's a big drive towards getting more industry partners into into the setting. Um, and any examples of how uh, they can support that that framework that you've uh, so eloquently explained for us, Steph. Sorry, I missed that last that you broke up on my screen. <laughs> Or it may be my Wi-Fi as well. Um, how how industry partners can really um, support that framework and, and and what they what what they can do to uh, be made aware of it as well because they want to come in with their own ideas too uh, about how they are supporting uh, our learners um, and what other things they can do to really understand right okay this is how we do it this is the best way to um, to deliver our own expertise in, in an education setting. 
I think you've touched on one of the key parts is it's just about getting this resource out there so sharing it so that they're aware that this is kind of the the expectation that's been set um, and also I mean as much as the expectations within the our best future resource are kind of you know stipulated within it the content itself is 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 meant to be very kind of you know supportive in the fact that it's like we're not saying this is 100% how you have to do it but we're hoping that this at least opens up the doors to conversation as here's some things you should be considering if you've not already. So just kind of getting it out there, I think is the, the first thing is how we can get um, industry partners also engaging in it, that they know that these are the kind of conversations that we're encouraging colleges to be having internally. And then it's how that's then reflected externally with others who are engaging with learners. So that there's kind of a, a parity across how that engagement looks and that um, learners are having that opportunity to kind of shape and influence at, at different levels and at different stages of, of their, their college um, environment. And um, so I think that's probably one of the key parts is just that this is kind of recognised as kind of um, the, a resource that people should be should be looking at and utilising and, and thinking, you know, we're doing we're doing OK on maybe some parts. Yeah, we have been engaging with the Student Association to have these kind of discussions. But perhaps actually when we're thinking about um, this part of the curriculum and, and maybe in terms of like how that links in with with employers and with, you know, how curriculum is, is designed and built, maybe we could be doing more linkage to bring learners into both that internal conversation of the curriculum in the college, but how also that impacts on them employers and kind of what they want learners to be sort of discussing and deciding as well. I don't know if that fully answers your question. No, it, it certainly does, but it probably leads into the, the, the first part of that question about any practical examples, um, and that's maybe for the wider uh, you know, delegates here to, to maybe put some of their comments on, but no, that's definitely covered everything from, from my perspective, Steph, thanks. I think it's well, about... I would also just say... Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm just thinking back to, look, when we did the modern apprenticeship reviews and things, and we spoke a lot with industry partners, and I, I think you're absolutely right, and especially, I know Sparks have been trying to work a lot with apprentices to get, you know, apprentices more engaged in what's going on in colleges, and that probably does lead to a bit more work being done with the actual employers and the industry partners, um, because usually when they come to the tables, they're not really aware of these kind of frameworks that are out there that maybe they, they should be made more aware of. So that's something for us to take forward. What I just would want to say as well, as much as this resource is, um, if you you know, produced and published, we're very um, we're very keen that it's seen as a live document and that we really want to bring um, feedback from discussions like this and ongoing discussions that we're having with, with colleges and with student associations. So if there's something that's missing or if there's something that could be expanded upon or if you, you start to work on this and you realise actually we need more support in this area, I think we would use um, these events and the resource and kind of see that as a very fluid um, opportunity to update that and make it more relevant, make it more useful as the, the academic year develops and as the situation continues to change as well. Um, so we do really um, encourage you know, all the feedback as well on, on how it's been used or how it could be modified and adapted to make it as relevant as possible for, for those who are using it. Thank you. Um, well, can I ask myself uh, that um, obviously we've um, gone through over the past few months a uh, changing uh, scenario of student engagement and um, is, is there a mechanism for community and sharing the, the good practices and lessons learned through this uh, that comes along with the, the toolkit? I think that's definitely something that we're very keen to explore as in how this can be one of a number of ways that we're actually mm -hmm. finding out from learners what the impact of the pandemic has been on their learning experience. And um, our intention at Sparks, one of the projects that we're working on is to use this toolkit as one of them, as well as a series of other things that we're thinking of, and um, to pull together a kind of national picture, what has been the student experience like for colleges and universities across Scotland over the last nine months, and potentially for the next however many months or years to come. So that kind of short term impact, you know, kind of what has been the kind of um, run of things that's happened and what have been the kind of challenges and barriers that have maybe been faced by particular cohorts of students what have been those additional barriers and then looking into the longer term um, and how that impacts on future planning and um, what you know what what are students thinking in terms of, of of what's you know been what's changed what's different what has been in some ways better um, and we know that there has been some 
um, instances where the modifications that have been made um, and what's been taken online um, has increased um, student engagement and has benefited students. So I think there's lessons learned there that we need to then nurture and think about. So I think there is a wider project there, a wider piece of work that really is trying to bring all that together so that we can um, have our, our lessons learned from lockdown as such. You know, what do we want to keep on doing? What do we need to think and consider more? Um, what have been the hard lessons learned? Um, and, and what does that mean for us as a sector? And I think a lot of us will have experienced very similar challenges and it's then a chance for us as a sector to respond to that. I think one of the, I was in a, a meeting with one of my colleges last night and there was a very good example of that where they're talking about, you know, phased bringing students back into campus. And one of the departments has surveyed the students and they don't want to come back into campus. They're happy to continue with the, the virtual mode of delivery. And I think that's very important that we remember that, that and we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and think, or now that you know we can get more people in, that we should just automatically do that. So I thought that was very interesting that they've taken that approach and to listen to the different learned groups and, and see what, what can be done, you know, and it's not going to be a one size fits all, but it is important that we, we take time and we, we listen to what learners are needing. Yeah, and a good example of where engagement uh, has a benefit over making assumptions about uh, the way things should be, thank you. Um, any further? Uh, yes, uh, so we uh, story P. Uh, story, <laughs> sorry, there's Phil. Uh, uh, there. Hi there. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, I've not had a proper chance to, to kind of read through the, the toolkit. Uh, my name's Phil Storier. Um, I am a director of student experience and uh, academic performance at Dumfries and Galloway, and. Um, Actually, our student association president is on this call. Bronwyn is in here somewhere as well. So uh, it's good for her to, to be involved in this. Um, but what we've done at Dumfries and Galloway is we decided that, you know, uh, off the back of the October holiday, that was a good time to just throw a wee pulse survey together in terms of really getting a flavour um, from students of, of where they are just now, you know, and again, that thing of not making assumptions and UK, we might have supported them with a digital resource, but actually do we know if they have a space to work and do we know if they're enjoying that mode of study and things and actually the findings of that to date have been really interesting. Um, Margaret uh, kind of alluded to that there, but um, part of uh, what was interesting was only about 30% of the people, the students that had actually completed the survey were at this moment in time, you know, wanting to come back onto the building. And so that in itself needs a bit of exploration. Anyway, the main point of what, what has led us to discussion around is that, you know, in terms of student engagement, what I'm interested in is mechanisms and tools. What are the best methods for us to increase uh, participation in those types of activities because what I'm acutely aware of is that we've had really good data back and, and really good qualitative uh, data from students that is allowing us to really individualise support for them but across the student population overall it's quite a low percentage um, and initially some of those conversations we've had um, with Bronwyn and the student association guys we found that some of it is just simply to do with there's too much information coming out from too many places. Um, so we're about to, to look at, well, what is, you know, actually is it a single source of information? Do we actually just need to provide students with one place that they can come to, that they know we are going to come to, to get their feedback in formal and informal ways? And that's particularly more difficult where we can't just, you know, go walk through the canteen or go into classrooms and discuss things. So we are looking at that as, well, what tool do students want us to use rather than us using three or four different tools and hoping? Because actually we're, what we're finding just now, if I'm being honest, and I'm only in the job three weeks, I have to say, it's our first uh, stab at it. But we're putting it out through social media, through marketing, through teams, through, you know, in-house. And actually, we've still only had about 300 responses across the whole student body. So there's two things for me. What is the best tools to use to actually engage the student body? And I'm actually in a position where I want to almost set targets for us to say that actually, unless we can say we have spoken to at least 80% of our student body, we don't have enough information. So it's, what tools can we use if there's anyone get any thoughts on that? Um, in terms of tools, but also the second thing for me, sorry, is how do we encourage engagement in that democratic process? Because actually those skills of engaging in student surveys is, is really useful beyond your college life. So, you know, I suppose while the group is here, that's two questions. Uh, what is a great, what, what sort of process should we use to get 
increase our feedback from students and increase that engagement and also how can we support the, the, the broader student body to develop the skills that are needed to participate in that? I don't know if, who could answer that or has anyone got any thoughts, but anyway, I know it's quite a big question. Um, I just want to come in and say I think like some of their key tools and what is touched on in the resource quite heavily actually is around about utilising the student association and the role of student reps and course reps. Um, they're already embedded integrated systems and they already have processes in place to think about how they're gathering feedback from students and um, how they're feeding that feedback into the right processes and right channels and then how they're taking that back from those committees and those staff to, to the learners themselves. So I think that in terms of a tool or a mechanism, it's utilising those already established and existing um, Sort of students who are in who are in the best position, best place to be engaging directly with their own peers, and um, when thinking about what's working or what's not, um, and that is about having you know, and it seems that you do, you know, if Bronwyn's volunteer as well, and that you're already having those discussions, but having a strong relationship with your student association and with your student mm -hmm. leaders, and um, to think about you know the recognised tools and mechanisms that they know students can effectively engage in. And um, you touch on a little bit around about, you know, communication saturation that, you know, you're putting loads of stuff out there that is almost, you know, diluted because it's too much or they're not getting it from all places. But then there's the risk that if you don't put it in enough places, it's not capturing everyone because not everyone uses social media, not everyone checks their emails. And yeah. um, that's a never ending battle um, in terms of how you're putting things out there. Um, and it's just, you know, it, some of it is about thinking you know, what are the, the mechanisms that students are responding to most effectively? You know, what is it that's, that's the, the easiest way for them to engage in a meaningful way that's not putting extra pressure or extra um, burden on them to have to try and engage that, the, that they can, you know, that there's effective mechanisms in place for them to be able to feed back mm -hmm. honest opinion about what's working and what's not um, without having to kind of um, jump through lots of hoops to do it you know just something that gives them a direct route and course reps really are one of the strongest ways of that and um, so I think there's there's ways to explore your existing mechanisms in that I would also say that you know utilizing the questions that we've developed through the student learning experience and embedding that into your existing practices so if you you know your module evaluation forums your internal survey and um, um, student staff consultative committees where you're having these types of discussions if you can start embedding those questions and they just become common questions that you're all the time you'll start to get a bit of a flavor then and that you can then look over a, a, a period of data to think right this is this is something that we we know is an issue if, if you're asking that across a wide variety of established places and um, that's just from from a spark point of view but i'm sure others will have other comments and suggestions I think just picking up in Kenji's comment there, I mean, he, he said, you know, about keeping, keeping people informed about engagement, about how many people have completed a survey, what the results are so far. Um, certainly that's something by experience. I, I've seen his work well in a college environment. Um, even we used to do the things like, and I'm showing my age now, where we had a whiteboard as you went into the refectory saying you said we did, but we can do that electronically. These are things that can be um, posted out to students because it's important that students know what's done with their feedback. I mean, I know myself, if I'm filling out a survey and nothing happens about it, then I won't fill out the next one. You know, so it's really important once you do engage is that you, you say, here's what students told us and here's what we've done about that. Here's what the impact has been. So, I mean, there's lots of examples of that, you know, good examples of that. But I know as well, even in a previous life, I was instructed by my principal, I had to have a hundred percent return, Kenji. So we almost had to like, you know, every time a student was in a class, you were saying, you've got to fill out this survey, you've got to fill out this survey. And that that's just nonsense. I mean, I, I heard anecdotally then from the student association, you know, they were playing games, they were doing an arrow, they were doing this and, you know, just putting the feedback in different shapes and things to see what would happen. So. The non, we were getting one hundred percent feedback, but it was absolute rubbish, <laughs> you know. So, it's a lot to consider there. Yeah, and I think that. Uh, so I'm Will. I'm from NUS, um, and I think that there's there's things there around like you know, eking out what different participation strands you have, um, and really setting um, useful measures against those as well. So. Yeah, maybe you're only getting 200 back, but actually, if that was uh, that wasn't a consultative um, process, that would be that would be actually really good because you were getting really the the depth of the feedback. 
whilst maybe um, yeah, thinking about what ways in which you want people to participate and how, um, and then really setting those targets which are meaningful for, for, for those particular areas um, and what also that um, the students would see as successful. Like what is it that um, they would see from their side as a as sort of a successful, meaningful engagement um, and, and, and sort of flipping it a little bit because I think we can set these sort of internal metrics, but actually um, what, would it, what would it look like and how you, can you demonstrate that from their side um, uh, or from what they can see as well. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's some really good examples it, as, you know, as some people were saying, you know, where you can see what things are ongoing um, and how things are progressing. Um, but, you know, that doesn't even just have to be from the education sector. You know, Helsinki, for instance, did an amazing um, participatory budgeting where they were keeping their citizens continually updated and it meant more and more people got, in, got involved. Um, and they had various both, both digital and in-person um, uh, mechanisms in which to involve people in that in that kind of process. So maybe there's examples from from civic society as well that we can um, we can harness. Yeah. Hi, um, can I just say I'm Sarah from Fife College. We've got a student survey live at the moment, and uh, we had kind of anticipated the kind of questions we wanted to ask based on what we thought this year was going to be like. So a lot of what's in the framework we've already incorporated into this learner survey which was good, quite lucky in that respect. We've looked at the technology that students are happy to use. And we've been using text messages to send out links to students so they can do it on their phone, wherever they are. At the moment, we've got almost 3,400 students responded. So that's about 66%. We've still got another few days left on it. Uh, so a lot of the feedback that we've had so far has been that people are lonely. They're enjoying their studies, but they are so lonely and they feel isolated. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking at the different groups. Again, computing, they are absolutely loving being at home, doing home learning. It's mm -hmm. working for certain people, but not for others. Mm -hmm. But yeah, looking at how the technology reaches people and how willing they are to embrace the technology, that's, that's really worked for us this year. And of course, making sure that you don't preload the question. I have seen surveys uh, put out by email asking for uh, whether you're happy using email and from there getting a 100% response. Um, very easy to uh, to fall into that sort of trap, and then, especially in the digital world and working for JISC, that's true. Um, Okay, the question there for you, Sarah, is to, from Kenji, as to whether that response rate was higher than lower than normal or what you expected. Uh, well, I've been in the role for just over a year uh, learner surveys are my remit. Uh, last year when I started, I wanted to introduce the text messages and we went from 43% response rate in our SSES, or our big survey of the year, and uh, we managed to get 70%. So it was a massive difference. Again, it's different this year because usually I'd be on campus, I'd be talking to students about the survey. This year we've had to rely on a lot of the academic staff to mention it in their teams. Uh, to talk about how they've used the survey last year. So again, uh, completing the feedback loop, that has got us more responses yeah. than we were expecting to get, especially during the pandemic. But it's, I mean, it's strengthening the different communication tools that we have. Uh, the FCSA, they have been absolutely fantastic in supporting us from the other end as well. So it's trying to find ways to speak to everybody in ways that they're happy to be spoken to. So I think, Phil, thanks for starting off that conversation. I think there's two elements to it, and that is the right communication channel, the right tools in order to do it, but also um, the partnership uh, part of it as well, um, and the student feeling that uh, they're actually making a difference, being heard um, as part of the, the process as well, and, uh, and who want to, wouldn't want to be engaged with that. And also I would um, put a vote, I think for Will, you made the, the comment that different depths of engagement being available uh, is quite a... A, a, a good way to ensure engagement. Sometimes we're only at a high level of being able to say we're satisfied or, or dissatisfied. And other times we're willing to give more substantial feedback and, and uh, different people in different situations have different capacity to do that. So providing for that is an important way of, uh, in uh, the engagement. 
OK, well, with that, we've hit uh, the, the half hour, so I'm going to bring the formal part to a close. Can I give a big thanks to Steph and Margaret for uh, giving us a view into the toolkit? Um, I'm no doubt that it's going to be a very useful facility and tool for uh, for use, uh, use in considering student engagement at a very important time. So thank you once again. <laughs>